morning. Today I'm going to talk about the development of a standard test phantom for magnetic resonance guided high intensity focused ultrasound. As the word suggests, MR guided IFU is the combination of magnetic resonance imaging and high intensity focused ultrasound for thermal ablation of unwanted tissue. An IFU transducer delivers a high level of ultrasound intensities to increase the temperature into the tissue. When the temperature exceeds 56 degrees for one second, there is irreversible damage of the tissue. Magnetic resonance imaging is used for targeting the region of interest, for monitoring the temperature in real time, and for assessing treatment effectiveness. At St. Thomas Hospital, we have a Philips on a leave, which is marked for treatment of bone metastasis and uterine fibroids. As you can see, the patient is positioned into the MRI scanner, and an anatomical image is taken for treatment planning. The IFO transducer delivers uh, high intensity focus ultrasound, while the MRI thermometry allows uh, real time monitoring of the temporal rise. Later on, you can take another image to assess the treatment effectiveness. So, why do we need the test object? The use of IFO is becoming widespread, and there is the need to standardize the way in which the therapies are described and reported. The main ultrasound field parameters, such as local pressure or local intensities, are well described in water. However, there is the need to define parameters for describing the interaction of the ultrasound fields in the medium. In other words, we need dose quantities, something equivalent to the absorbed dose or the equivalent dose that is used in ionizing radiation. For thermal ablation therapy, we need a simple device that allows the quantification of temporal rise induced by an IFO source in a reference material. This can be useful for many applications, such as the assessment of performance of existing device, definition of QA and calibration protocols, optimization of procedures, and comparison of results across the centers. When you want to build the Phantom, the first problem you have is the choice of materials. Materials are to be compatible with the technology of interest, which in this case are ultrasound and magnetic resonance imaging. We use the well-known IC recipe, which is an agar-based TMM and the speed of sound 15-40 meter per second and attenuation 0.5 dB per centimeter. We use 3D printed bone equivalent disc to mimic flat bone and type T copper constantan thermocouple of size 75 micron to be MRI compatible and to minimize interaction with ultrasound fields. Thermocouples were placed in the region below the bone and above the bone and one thermocouple was used as reference. Positioning tools and the gravings were manufactured for supporting thermocouple identification in the 3D space in magnetic resonance imaging. Here you can see the setup of the phantom on the sonar lib. This is the IFU table, this is the phantom, this is the MRI call. The IFU transducer is placed below the phantom. This is a screenshot of the sonar lib console, so you can see coronal, transverse and sagittal view of the phantom and monitoring of the near field. You can see the positioning tools and how they help into the identification of the thermocouple and you can see the 3D printed bone. What you do is simply to place a cell in a region of interest, you select the power, press a button and the sonication will start. MRI thermometry allows the temperature monitoring in real time and the console will tell you information about the power and the length of the exposure. This looks like uh, quite a good system, a cool system, however, it's quite limited in spatial resolution and temporal resolution. In order to assess the reproducibility of the machine, we did three experiments in two different days with two different settings, bone metastasis and uterine fibroids. The table shows absolute temperature rise, while in clinical practice you need to think that you start from a temperature of about 37 degrees of the human body. Thermocouples shows a variability between 10 and 50%, and MRI thermometry shows a variability between 10 and 30%. Percentage difference between thermocouple and MRI thermometry was between 10 and 22%. These are simple plots that show the temporal rise as function of the power. Obviously, as possible in bone, the temperature is quite high, so you lose a bit of linearity in terms of temperature dependency. If you think that uh, these errors are quite big, actually they are not, because there are many sources of error across the experiment. These errors are both random and systematic. In particular, there is the ability to target 75 micron junction of the thermocouple, and there is uh, the viscous heating artifact. 
The viscous seeding artifact is due to the interaction between the ultrasound fields and the thermocouple. This error has been minimized by choosing a small thermocouple, that is 75 micron, as is about 5% of the wavelength of the beam, and using the second derivative method, which has been described by Morris et al. So in conclusion, uh, we achieved our goal, we developed the test object, which is a working prototype and allows temporal quantification in a reference material. Main limitation of the study are for sure the number of experiments, which are just three. However, you need to deal with the clinical schedule of the machine and the cost, which is about £500 per hour, although I'm a hospital staff. In addition, we had COVID-19, we are a K hospital, so the research activity was completely stopped. It would be also nice to collect and compare data with different scanner and add to the phantom motion and perfusion, which can further challenge the machine. Finally, thermocouple provide measurement in a single point, and this is a major limitation. However, we are already moving forward and we got a grant to develop a thin film matrix array sensor for temperature distribution measurements. In addition, we have a paper under review in ultrasound in medicine and biology for the development of a PVA-based thermochromic material. So this material changes color uh, um, in relation to temperature in the region of interest of IFO. And this material is quite interesting because it can be embedded in phantoms or in 3D model. I would like to thank my team and I'm happy now to take your question. Hello everyone and welcome to this talk. First of all, I would like to thank the committee for organizing this session and allowing me to participate. My name is Anders Hagen Edmund and I'm a third year medical student at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology with a master's degree in applied physics and mathematics. Today I will talk about distributable hemodynamics in neonate and describe what we have found relating to how this cerebral blood flow is maintained during mild hemodynamic stress in healthy term units. The talk is based on the manuscript now ready for submission. So this is the question I want all of you to have in the back of your minds during the presentation as it summarizes our aim. I will start by talking about the tilt because it is very illustrative for why we have done this study and briefly introduce cerebral autoregulation. I assume that you're all familiar with ultrasound techniques in general but I will show you the specific ultrasound system that we have used as it is quite recently developed, and this study was in part conducted to demonstrate some of the applicabilities of the system. I will also take you through the experimental setup and data analysis, and finally show you some results. Here you can see a neonate laying on its back in supine position, with a heart and a brain in approximately the same height. If the neonate is tilted head up, for example when its mother holds it towards the chest, introduce a height difference between the heart and the brain, resulting in a hydrostatic pressure that must be overcome. For comparison, the mean arterial blood pressure in term neonates is about 40 mm of mercury. So we get this gradient that would make the blood leave from the brain and being pulled into the feet. Luckily, we have several mechanisms that contract this and ensure a stable blood perfusion of all organs. But today we will only focus on one single mechanism the cerebral autoregulation. In general, cerebral autoregulation is about ensuring stable brain perfusion despite fluctuating blood pressure. There is a physiological range where the vessel radius decreases as the systemic blood pressure increases and the blood flow is kept relatively stable. But outside this range, the vessel radius passively changes with pressure. And these ranges are different from individual to individual making it hard to use only systemic blood pressure to assess the risk of malperfusion, although it's the best we have at the moment. Being newborn is stressful, and some neonates, and especially those born prematurely, can have a less developed autoregulation, rendering them vulnerable to malperfusion, either hyper or hypoperfusion, that may result in brain damage. There are some strategies for managing malperfusion, and it's important to detect it early to begin prophylactic treatment to avoid neurological complications. Now I will introduce Neodoppler, 
which is the ultrasound system we used in this study. It was recently developed by Professor Hans Teutp and his group, and has been tested in different hospitals in Norway. I will show you a short animation. In brief, we attach a Doppler transducer operating at 7.8 MHz to the fontanella of the neonate, and insulate the vessel below. We are able to simultaneously monitor all vessels between 3 to 35 mm from the probe, and we pick the vessels of interest afterwards. The system is designed for continuous monitoring of neonates. So to summarize, we're actually looking at two questions. How does the cerebral blood flow in neonates change during and after head up tilt? And if Neodoppler was able to measure these changes? We have already looked at the tilt test and how it affects the infant and the Neodoppler system. Now I will first take you through the test setup and then talk a bit about our analysis. We had 44 neonates participating on two consecutive days after birth, and we analyzed 56 recordings in total. Here you can see the mean velocity recording from a single test. The infant was laid on its back with the needle probe attached. After 40 seconds, we tilted him upwards and kept him in upright position for 200 seconds before we laid it back again and monitored for 60 seconds, so five minutes in total. We measure the blood pressure before start and after 120 seconds as indicated. We divided the signal into four time segments, or time windows of 40 seconds. For each of these segments, we calculated the average mean velocity, heart rate, and pulsatility index. Please have these segments in mind as we will return to them later. The Doppler spectrum is automatically traced by the new Doppler system, and numbers for mean blood flow velocity pulsatility index and heart rate are extracted continuously. So we get these data as time signals, and we calculate the average of the four segments as I mentioned. But we'll lose a lot of information by just extracting mean values from a period and ignoring the instant time changes. So to characterize the immediate response, we defined another time window containing the tilt, and analyzed the signal as a time series using k-means clustering for longitudinal data. This method allowed us to identify similar signals, based on several quality criteria we chose five clusters. Here you can see them. The black lines are the cluster means. The signals were normalized to baseline, that is the mean of the first time segment, prior to tilt. Next we used linear mixed models to look at how these clusters of immediate responses were related to changes on longer periods of time, by using the four time segments we discussed earlier. Here you can see how the mean blood flow velocity, pulsatility index, and heart rate change from baseline, that is prior to tilt, and during the test. You can see that some of the differences persist through the test. We couldn't find any predictors of cluster assignment, and a neonate often changed cluster from day to day, but that's in line with earlier research. If you look carefully, you can see that the clusters behave differently and have a kind of signature. For example, if you look at cluster C, it is the only cluster with a decrease in blood flow velocity and an increase in both pulsatility index and heart rate. In other words, we cannot distinguish the responses with a single feature alone, but only when looking at several at once. To summarize, we found that healthy neonates present with a range of normal responses to tilt, and with Neodoppler we were able to detect rapid changes in blood flow velocity. Thank you for listening.